so today I'm trying to uh, show an alternative to using R more like a like for partial support in the back end. We do a bit of an experiment on my site since I I needed a web application that can write uh, summarized experiment objects and export them. And that was uh, the main challenge here, I guess you can only do this in R and integrating that on the web server uh, in the database uh, seemed like uh, it would be great if I can uh, run R in the background without using shell scripts and other stuff like that. So just to recap the, for, I don't know, for those that are not maybe familiar with the architecture, basic architecture of a web application, uh, the simplest uh, one model is the one built around static pages, uh, web pages like book down sites or most GitHub pages where the web content is simply stored as static documents uh, in the files, in the file structure on the server and it's retrieved statically to be shown in the front end browser of the client. So in this case, the, the backend is a simple HTTP server that does not perform any complex computations or data retrieval, just retrieves files from the data system, from the file system. Uh, the front end makes usually one shot requests uh, as for the HTTP protocol, you just uh, send the request, receive the output, and then it disconnects uh, from the server, uh, usually. But these days, a lot of stuff can be done even in the front end, uh, which even in this, this simple model can make it look like the content is not as really static. For example, uh, some data and complex code, uh, JavaScript code can be embedded in the re retrieved web pages and can perform very complex uh, operations in the front end on the, essentially on the client computer, uh, like displaying uh, complex interactive plots, like with Plotly on HTML, HTML widgets. Uh, in, uh, for example, in Quarto and Markdown rendered uh, notebooks, and or even run actually R code inside the browser, which is what the web R uh, does. And I think Hedia showed this recently how this would work in a static web page. Actually, you can run R commands in the front end. Now, full stack up. Uh, uh, Classical full stack uh, uh, web application has <clears throat> multiple components, and um, the front end is usually managed dynamically by a JavaScript framework, uh, like complex JavaScript frameworks like Angular, uh, React.js, SolidJS. Well, there are dozens of such JavaScript frameworks for front end mostly uh, these days. Um, this front end not only allows the user to build the complex user interfaces. Um, but also provides specific APIs to request dynamic content and perform uh, queries from the backend servers. Uh, the backend usually involves a middleware component. It's part of the server of the backend that is often a Node.js uh, with an express uh, HTTP server that can uh, provide complex routing, uh, routing to help the front end request to the a real deep backend uh, computer storage servers, which are usually in the cloud these days. Uh, so it's like a middle management dispatcher. The middleware is uh, this Node.js uh, server is a middle management dispatcher of the front end requests to the uh, end endpoint servers in the deep backend, like it is a database server. So in uh, in my case, uh, this resides on server 16 here, Liber, for the portal application. I'm going to detail a uh, uh, moment. Now, uh, this, uh, for a few years back at least, they used to uh, write these acronyms to describe the components of the stack. Like, for example, the mean stack had the MongoDB server in the backend. Express and Node are pretty much, uh, I don't know, they are just uh, put there. They are part of the middleware or uh, essentially the server interface there. Uh, 
and the express is just a package of node but i guess they wanted to uh, to add to edit layer to to make the the acronym more uh, meaningful so in my case i guess what i'm pretty much having here in the data portal is the I would call it Perm stack, which is Postgres, Express, React, JS, and Node. Now, for uh, it's interesting to compare this with the R shiny uh, application architecture, which is very interesting for me. It was a new thing to discover how it uh, really works in the background. So it's a uh, I shiny application is a special kind of client server architecture which in which the first request for a shiny uh, server URL uh, makes the UIR code running in on the server to generate the front end JavaScript code, which is then sent back to the client to be rendered in the client and where also in the client it opens a special bidirectional uh, web socket connection between the JavaScript code in the front end and the R server code in the back end. Um, as opposed to the classic request response model, uh, which is of the HTTP protocol, of the old HTTP protocol, where it's just like a hit and run, uh, it disconnects immediately after the receiving the response. Um, in this web, so web socket connection in R Shiny is actually a permanent connection between client and server which allows bidirectional uh, communication uh, in almost you know, close to real time between the front end uh, and the R code in the back end. And this is very convenient for interactivity and continuous communication and data exchange between uh, client and server, but um, of course can also be costly in terms of server resources to maintain this continuous connect, connect connections with the, with the clients, which kind of limits a bit the number of concurrent um, clients. Um, it's important to know that the front end is fully uh, controlled, or uh, I would say puppeteer, puppeteered through the WebSocket connection by the backend R code in an R Shiny application. So since, uh, well, it, this really a shiny application is all R, so you have to basically write everything in R. You can inject some JavaScript, but it's a bit uh, uh, it's a bit messy. Um, you can actually I, I chose this for multiple reasons to to stick to the classical full stack uh, application for for our server. Um, since we have a for the portal we have this. Uh, Essentially, a Perl stack, as I said earlier, it's Postgres, Express, React, and Node with a twist. Uh, the twist being that I can run R code on demand, so only for some some requests in this uh, from the client, I can run this uh, R code directly in the database server uh, memory space, um, close to the database to the data in the tables in the data, and this is why it was quite a nice feature of Postgres server actually. So how was this possible is uh, due to the fact that the, the Postgres is uh, an open source enterprise class relational database management system that is very powerful and flexible as it can support uh, these user written uh, extensions which are like software modules, uh, libraries that can extend the functionality of the server process uh, in a very modular way. So these extension models run directly uh, in the server, as I said, and uh, as some sort of server-side plugins. Um, the Postgres server provides an API uh, by which such extensions are given direct access to the database, uh, to the data hosted on, on the server. And the main advantage being essentially getting software to run very close to the, to the data, to the, to the metal. <laughs> Uh, that is like having the best possible bandwidth in terms of data exchange, data uh, access uh, from the database server. There is no need to send the data through the network connections, as is, as is usually the case uh, with the, uh, to a remote client. Of course, when you send the results back to the 
actual client in this uh, full stack application, you usually send the summaries or something. But the, the great thing is you can run uh, very complex programs, even written in like Python and uh, with using machine learning packages and stuff like that, uh, close to the data in the database. So in the server space and then send whatever results back to the client. So we support these language extensions, which is which is really great. That's how I found that it supports actually R. It's one of the few. I don't mm -hmm. know if there's another one, another database server like this that uh, supports so many languages, including R. Um, so sorry, sure. I have a question about the integration. Yeah, with R. I think there is a package you can like uh, to integrate Postgres with R, if I'm not wrong. Yes, that's actually the, the you, DBI uh, yeah, database interface, interface. client, yeah. uh, but that so, is different. So that is running on the client side. Yeah. Uh, so you connect remotely to the server and basically you use the network connection, but the R code runs on you and you just query the server uh, this way. Or update us. We can do a lot of operations, of course, but and that's interesting because that our, our PostgreSQL package is mm -hmm. actually emulated. The interface is emulated inside the R code in this PLR extension at the end. Mm -hmm. um, that I said, the, uh, uh, I guess, yeah. This would be uh, the P the PLR is a procedural extension that this is running in in the server space itself. As I said, basically use the server resources. And it's indeed in initially directly connected to the data. So basically, this uh, R extension uses emulates the R PostgreSQL uh, package with the database connection that's already built in. With the data in the R PostgreSQL package, you have to ask for a database connection handler first. They open the connection to authenticate, yeah. and then if based on that connection handler, you you submit queries or something like that to the server. In this case, the connection is built in once you get the R code running, it's like the connection is already open because it runs on the server and they are connected to the current database. Mm -hmm. I will see some example code there. Okay. But, um, now, uh, back to the our Perm stuff uh, stack, I guess I would call it partner or something because it has another R there, right? From R, um, some of the code is served actually is uh, in R. So um, this is how I implemented in the data portal. Uh, the the beauty of this approach is that um, as opposed to shiny apps, I'm only using R code uh, once in a while when I need like R in this in this stack just to execute some specific R code. In this, uh, because most of the this full stack web application functionality does not really require R. You can do a lot with the node packages um, for a general purpose uh, web application. And for example, the, the middleware can uh, actually handle many tasks through this Node.js uh, as code. As there are many node packages that can provide this a lot of functionality in the backend in JavaScript directly. From uh, querying a Postgres database, uh, accessing even HDF5 uh, files, or even scheduling shell scripts uh, or other complex tasks, like I did, for the example, for the uh, genotype extraction query for a list of brains. Uh, it's implemented in the portal as a Node.js um, in the middleware there. Uh, which happens to run on server 16, also close to the database. But in this case, it doesn't need to access the database. So from Node.js in there for genotypes, I just query essentially the file with the, uh, the not genotypes file with a with a script that just extracts the, the brains uh, that are needed and uh, sends an email. When the, the extraction is done, a few some minutes later, the email was sent to the user with a new URL to download the the genotypes. Um, but there are some some cases where you that obviously obvious use case here is, is writing a summarized experiment object. And this is what prompted uh, me to actually try to see if I can use R in the backend. Uh, because you know it's a this is a native uh, format for R. You can do some tricks to use it in 
Python, but also kind of calls R essentially. So um, the, well, the idea, ideal solution here is to actually use this PLR extension to, to build uh, RSCs, set some of the experiment objects based on the user query. Now to actually get the code out, our code to run on the server, of course, there's a bit of a protocol. For example, when everybody knows, uh, you have to load usually a lot of packages, uh, right, in order to get stuff done in R. <laughs> and some of them can take a while. Uh, there's an also the pop-up yeah. delay. So uh, there is a way, uh, standard is like an out of start uh, table in uh, in Postgres, because of course in a database server, everything is done through tables pretty much. So there's a table where you can dedicate it to this extension, uh, Postgres R extension, where you can specify what uh, code to be executed in each, in what order. And um, from this table, whenever you ac access uh, an R uh, function, uh, this there will be a this code will be triggered to execute all this sequentially this code in the table, and actually these fields you see the server uh, the end, the fifth entry here uh, is actually this is a text field in mod src uh, column that could be very large. It's actually uh, the full code for this. It's basically it's sourcing this script, our script where I define my own functions that I need later to package uh, RSCs or uh, even create Plotly uh, plots. Uh, in this case, using uh, R for Plotly was really not necessary because uh, basically you can, Plotly is a JavaScript package, so you can use it directly from uh, Node.js, from JavaScript uh, backend uh, if you want, or if, yeah, even a lot of it is actually yeah, front-end Plotly uh, code, but uh, well, it was so easy to to add these extra, extra functions uh, that I prefer to to use uh, even plotly using R. It was more like an experiment. Uh, but yeah, the, this what I'm saying. It's not visible here if you just list the tables in a in a with a select. But uh, actually, the code that goes in there, it's uh, pretty pretty large. Uh, yes, yes. I def Sorry, I yeah. have a question about because I haven't seen like plots in the portal. So oh yeah, I'm gonna show you. They are there, but it is not very even publicized, I suppose. Okay. <laughs> they are there. Uh, yeah, so there are a lot of functions defined here, and uh, you know they simulate a database. That's what I was saying. So this uh, db get query and yeah. stuff like that. That's these are from the R PostgreSQL uh, okay. package. I mean the the, uh, the this extension emulates that package. So people, so user, uh, so developers can test their uh, code, our code, before putting it into the server. They can test it with an actual uh, DBI connection, yeah. right? And, and then, but basically, the DB connection handler, uh, as I have seen here, it's actually null. Basically, there's no, it's implied. Uh, but if you change this to a, if you move this code into a client. Uh, and you execute it as an R script from remotely, you can create this DB connection handler um, as as using the standard DBI approach, right? You specify the remote server, the user password, and you connect the server. So you can test all these functions here before you make them uh, embedded into the server, which is what I was ended up doing. Before you load this in this table, uh, <laughs> which will make them available to further code. But this is the first step. You, pay, you write the functions that you want there in R. Uh, you put them in this table, the code that you need to be, the functions that you need later. Um, but then the, <laughs> the actual workflow uh, is, let's see, like this, if I could. Uh, when a user first connects uh, to the web application, the Postgres session is started, then there is a way to trigger loading all those packages uh, by just calling a simple R function, like returning the R version uh, from, from, the, from the Postgres scale. Because otherwise, if you don't use any R functions, uh, the, fact, the code that I showed in this table uh, is not loaded. So it's it delayed to the first use of R, which is a very uh, well thought out thing because you might have another extension enabled in an application in a database, but you don't want that to be 
activated unless the user actually uses our code in their application in the connection. So again, because there is a delay when you run, uh, when you first load all these packages defined here, or even source your uh, extra functions, this takes a little bit of time, uh, a few seconds, several seconds sometimes. So you want to minimize that unless it's really necessary. So um, the way this works there are this, uh, there is, yeah, as users select samples from the portal, you can request either to download the data, either to, um, to, to, to plot uh, for those samples, but this is sent, the list of samples is sent through the middleware to, to these select queries in the backend. So I'm gonna show that basically the way you call our, our functions in Postgres is to use, of course, select queries. <laughs> you know, this is database server, so everything works through pretty much SQL. So they extended the language so you can call special procedure uh, it's actually written in in, in our, our language. Uh, but it, question. So if the user doesn't need an RC like uh, object, uh, so it doesn't trigger, you know, all the yeah, it doesn't load the code. Yeah. Okay. But in my case, I wanted to do that. I'm going to show it, to prevent the delay later because basically in this for this portal, the idea was people want to either usually download the data. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. and this is done in R. So that's a little trick that I'm using there. Uh, and, well, sorry, I think I wanted to, yeah, that, that's just, the idea is that when you first collect, connect uh, to, the, to the URL, actually I start the, an R, this R session, while the user, you know, just looks at the interface and can select samples. This is going in the background. So there is a status indicator there because it takes a few seconds to load all those packages, but only the first time uh, because you know these connections are cached and can, can be shared between multiple users. Uh, there's no persistency between the queries the way I, I did it, but only if one query is still running, it takes a while to run, then a new connection will be allocated to, a, to another user, concurrent user. But, uh, I don't know if I can reproduce this. If uh, I guess uh, I was wondering, I could always show if you follow this indicator at the at the top, you'll see that uh, it takes a while to 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 say the status is online because it's connected to the server. Mm -hmm. But also this PLR section here is loading our packages, and this takes a couple of seconds the list to be populated. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I didn't have. I guess I didn't have a. Uh, well, I could try it. Do you have an idea about how many user the application can handle at the same time? Oh, yeah, that's a problem. Uh, it's like, I don't think it's limited by the number of database connections. Uh, uh, that uh, that this, it's, uh, and this, this is indeed not that much. I think it, it's limited to like 40 or something. But this is a, an, an internal. Oh yeah, so it, it takes a while. Yeah, it takes a while. You see these dots here to appear to change to PLR. Sorry, it's sharing. Are you screen sharing this? Yes, I think so. Am I screen sharing this? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, hey, everybody. Uh, anybody? Uh, did you see anybody? Yeah, screen? I can see it. Okay. okay. I wasn't sure. Yeah, I guess it was it's so easy to miss, but basically there was like three dots here and it takes a while to actually show the PLR connection because it loads all those packages for this particular user ses session. But if I try to reload, uh, that connection is gonna be used. So probably you're not gonna see anything here. Yeah, it's it's reused. So it's already, it's, it's caching the connection here. Anyway, that's just a small detail related to the, <laughs> to the way, the delays that I'm trying to avoid, but this is happening while the user actually selecting the uh, the samples here because the, the idea is that all this sample selection and even counts and filtering um, happens in the front end. So this is completely happening on the user uh, side while the database can still do queries like in this case, the big query was to actually load those packages to be available 
the fine functions to be available for actually downloading the data or requesting genotypes and stuff like that. So anyway, back to, I try to go back here because uh, yeah, I think the order is not yet. Uh, just to exemplify in terms of code, what happens there um, in the front end, there's there are these functions, uh, JavaScript functions in the front end is just uh, like essentially, uh, they are translated these uh, interactions, like clicking on the plot button, um, it's gonna be translated to a essentially, ultimately to a fetch uh, query to the middleware. So the way I would explain this, uh, that, uh, what is how the Node Express server uh, defines these URL routes, which are, like you know, slash pgdb slash plot dl. This is a special route defined in the node uh, express server, so that when the fetch requests got, come from the front end to the middleware here uh, for these particular URLs, then a specific code uh, is activated. This is what is called typical uh, routing in routing in uh, express in node express uh, middleware uh, server code. So um, the same in this case uh, for, the, for this plot request, it's kind of a two two step operation. There are two fetch requests happening there. Uh, first, uh, where the plot is generated, um, but then um, has to be which is generated on server side by this uh, by this route uh, pgdb and plot dl, and then. Uh, the response to this is that oh we have a, a file ready where where this this plot was saved a JSON GC file I constantly compress it there is served on the server side and the response uh, directs a triggers another fetch request in the front end to actually fetch that file that was just written uh, and uh, display it in 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 this uh, code on the front end. So the file is sent to be downloaded or uh, yeah, to the by the front end, so it can be shown. Uh, the way this actually works again, since you said that you never saw an example, I can show a quick one. Uh, I guess I can just use experience and select, and even without logging in, you can explore this with a plot, like. Uh, on this stage, you can just you know, use some genes of interest. And when you, this is what happens now, the plot is what I was trying to describe here. The takes a little bit to select the, the samples. Uh, for these samples, only you know, plotting uh, these genes that are a bit control and schizophrenia. So yeah, in this case, it's a kind of a complex uh, chart here, but uh, the, the plotted code, code is sent back to the uh, to the front end. Um, yeah, so if I can get back here. So I know it seems complicated, but once thing, uh, things uh, start working and change properly, uh, it's uh, it's quite uh, fun <laughs> because a lot of things can be added there. A lot of uh, plots, uh, plot types. I don't know, I only have two right now, and I have time to add more. But uh, depends also on the data uh, from the tables how you store them. Um, because right now this is just simple normalized data. There are no, uh, you know, there's no. It's not just residuals, so. Um, could we could add more data there to make it properly like like what we do on the EPTL uh, browser and or developmental browser, uh, which has the proper uh, plots. Now, just to show exactly look how uh, how for our function our code is written uh, in this mix of uh, SQL and uh, and um, and R. Basically, you have to the header of the function is defined using the SQL language, Postgres uh, SQL uh, definition, and uh, which has this uh, this format here. That's how you define what's called stored procedures in in SQL. Like these are procedures that are stored, as I said, on the server uh, that are separate from the mod SRC. That's uh, that I showed earlier. That's a table only with the R code. 
But in order to actually activate those functions, it's call them from SQL, make them accessible to the select uh, query in SQL. You have to define them also internally in, in Postgres uh, directly using this kind of syntax. This is a very uh, fun example of, uh, of an encoder function uh, that a while ago we were trying to, I think, uh, I don't know if Leo remembers, we had this discussion to encode the large numbers, uh, IDs, which are like brain IDs, as a four letter code uh, with uh, has this uh, interesting syntax uh, that you have the first and the third uh, character being a, a letter and the second and the fourth being a digit. So when you write this down, like uh, in the lab, you you it's easy to avoid it's easier to prevent confusions due to writing of that was an interesting uh, idea but it was dropped after a while i think we never used this function but uh, it was nice to play with this with in, implemented in r and you see the r code is in the green portion right but everything else around it i mean the de declaration is uh, of the actual the way you declare this uh, plr functions is uh, is within this uh, interesting syntax and the data types are converted like for the parameters are converted automatically uh, there is a, comp a convert chart between you know that is, i have this integer array uh, and uh, returns a text uh, a string array essentially a string vector uh, but this is uh, of course postgresql uh, data types internally they they are converted as um, r data types and there's a one-to-one -one conversion for most of the data types. It's not that it's not that hard. Yeah. <clears throat> but of course, this makes if you develop but directly develop directly into the PostgreSQL uh, server like that, it's kind of hard to debug the R code because when you type messages or you print, uh, the the output is not shown except in server logs, database server logs. So you cannot really have uh, in, interaction for you know to debug like with using message or or uh, you know, printing uh, to output, printing messages. Um, but those do, have, if you you know check the server database server log, you can have some feedback. But sometimes the crashes are not very descriptive. If some code is wrong or the syntax, uh, you know, interpreted interpreter errors from R uh, have very obscure uh, messages showing up. And as I mentioned, yeah, the first uh, use of the R code, it triggers this de delay because all the tables, all the source code is from mod SRC is loaded, uh, this uh, code here. But uh, as I said, if I do this from the very beginning, while the user is still trying to understand what's on the page or selecting samples, uh, it's uh, it's okay to allow the few seconds uh, to load these models, modules, uh, packages. <clears throat> So uh, yeah, this was what I was showing earlier, the, the readiness indicator for the R session, which is plenty of time for most operations because it's, so it takes a few seconds to select what you want to download or uh, plot. Um, but now, of course, the way it's even, it's another level. So this, uh, this uh, definition of the, of the stored functions and procedure uh, in PLR, uh, the R on the server, is like I shown earlier, the little function now, um, this defines the actual functions, shows how the actual uh, stored procedures are, are uh, looking uh, simplified because it's just the top level to define in PostgreSQL. So you have this save RSC function and you just use select uh, save RSC essentially to, to get from the database server uh, the output of this function. But this actually calls uh, in R language, they specify the language PLR and it's actually R. Uh, this, this, this save RSC and, and, and uh, what was the other one? Save box plot, save age plot. These are actually defined, have to be defined in those um, modules. Uh, the code that is loaded initially when the R session starts from that mod SRC uh, uh, mod tables, actually column it in the PLR modules table, I think it's called, I, I see that one. It's, yeah, this, this is the table. 
yeah, it's PLR modules and it's models are C color. <laughs> so it's sort of like auto execution of the, when the first R code is, is ever launched in that session, uh, executed, then it starts loading all those. Um, now, um, it, if you, I don't know if, uh, yeah, I wanted to sh maybe show this, uh, well, of course, this is this is just high level. It's easy to define this in in PostgreSQL, and because the the all the complexity is hidden in these uh, R functions, which are loaded in that uh, table, PLR modules table, and yeah, the code is uh, as I showed earlier. It's pretty much defining all the functions that I need. Sometimes even some that I didn't necessarily need, but. Um, and there's interesting part here that, of course, uh, these functions, some of them, I had this dual access to the RSC, uh, to, to the range summarized experiment data. Uh, I found that, like for save RSC function, for example, it actually rebuilding from uh, the, the selected sample, RSC from the selected samples from the database rows is, as, uh, sometimes for larger uh, RSCs, slightly a few seconds slower than using an HDF5 backend. So I have these RSCs also stored on the server, just as plain you know, HDF5 uh, output uh, files. So let's see if it's, we build RSC. There is one at some point I, I realized that uh, it's actually slightly faster if I, instead of pulling it from the database, that's, this is because of the matrix, I say, uh, the, the say, uh, expression matrices there are very hard to store properly and retrieve efficiently from the database rows. The matrix uh, storage is still slightly better optimized in, in HDF5 format or just spe specialized file format databases with you know, typical database with tables in order to slice them, uh, either rows and columns. Uh, it's kind of, kind of hard to implement using uh, just a relational database uh, structures. So that's why, even though I try to optimize the database part, it still is slightly faster to get them from HDF, HDS, uh, HDF5 files prepared in advance with all the samples. Um, you know, so apparently that that is slightly slightly more efficient. Them here, but yeah, I think it's yeah this one it says it has here. Uh, basically, now I uh, this save RSC I benchmark these two branches of this save RSC function, uh, and I notice that if I pass the parameter H five and go go to slice slice HDF file instead of build RSCs from the database <laughs> based on the sample list given here. Oh, sorry, what has happened? Oh, that was because I double clicked on that. Okay. Yeah, it's this GitHub helping uh, to to see the symbols. Um, yeah, so basically, I benchmark these two branches. Uh, then when I pass the H five uh, parameter to be true, uh, it's a couple of seconds uh, sometimes for larger uh, selections using slice HDF from the file and uh, build RSC from the database. Those, uh, unless. That's another thing. I'm still looking for extensions for PostgreSQL extensions because which are numerous and very, they are amazing. Some of them, like they, uh, they can de define new data types or even, um, you know, new functions like machine learning uh, related. Uh, as I showed earlier, uh, it it you can even have a PG vector extension recently that's used for vector embeddings for LLMs can do semantic uh, singularity searches using that extension. So uh, it's, there are many things. Still, I couldn't find a good uh, matrix uh, storage extension for, for PostgreSQL. I mean, I guess there is one for HDF5, but the problem is, since I already need R to build the RSCs, I prefer to use the R route anyway to access the, uh, the HDF5 uh, storage instead of trying to use some PostgreSQL extension. Uh, that maybe you could done this faster because PostgreSQL extensions are written in, in C usually, uh, and they could be very well optimized for new data types or stuff like that. Uh, 
So in our is no interpreted language is still gonna be slightly slower than a C C extension, maybe. Uh, but so far I couldn't find a better way to access uh, those HDF5 RSCs. I guess that would be once <laughs> so, and early. <laughs> of course, if you have questions. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> You think other people are going to build this type of apps? I know there's a lot of potential, but of course, what you usually need is just time to set this up. And uh, yeah, you need also access to a good PostgreSQL server. And I was lucky if I had it. I have this control over this server 16, which implement this very well. Uh, I mean, it has like 512 of, uh, gigabytes of RAM. It's not huge, but still good. And uh, so you can run a few R sessions there <laughs> without the, uh, and I think 64 CPUs maybe or something. So yeah, if you have a good uh, server, uh, yes, it's nice. We can do a lot of things and very close to the data. I mean, I haven't even explored the Python part, which theoretically if you have nice storage there in the Python, uh, in, a, in the database, and you can just very quickly process those data right in tables. But again, all this stuff is also can be done usually with cloud services these days. Mm -hmm. There are like Snowflake and other a lot of Databricks and other stuff. They can, of course, for the cost, but you can do this even more efficiently that you use distributed computing. But this still the fact that it's open source and you can actually run it on a decent machine. Uh, at least to experiment with it, I thought it was it has a lot of potential. Hey, Joe, you know, great! Thanks for walking us through this. is very high level, but I still appreciate it. What What would you say is like the minimum requirements of the machine you want to run this kind of post server? And is it specific whether or not you're using R, uh, connection or something else that can be less memory intensive? Right. So yeah, for post the Postgres scale server itself, uh, it's scalable. I, I run it initially the test server at, at home. I run it on I think 16 gigs machine and even running, you know, testing these R code extensions and stuff. But of course for one single user it's pretty much it's okay, it's whatever. It's uh it's easy to to deal with if you see single user environment. The problem is scalability, yeah. You, but for one user, it's just a regular desktop machine could, could run all this. Mm -hmm. uh, and which is like more like a practice ground, right? We really want to deploy something like that on, on a larger architecture if, if needed, or maybe like a setup of larger application. So like you save the 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 like the data in on the server, but then at the same time you can build these R slash other kind of functions to manipulate the data so that people on the site can like get a quick exploration is that essentially it so you need to have enough storage for the data on the server as well uh right yeah well the hdf files are there right now because again i have this mixed uh query uh, i can either pull the data from from hdf5 or uh files that are quite large but or, the, for the, or from the database, but also the database right now, it's only it has RNA seq data and it's like maybe 20 gigabytes in the rows and so depends of course of the type of data that you want to process there. But uh, of course uh, this server can re can can be on a you know, remote also. Like for example, right now there's a super base thing that's actually based, based on PostgreSQL with all these extensions. And, you know, they have, basically it's a cloud provider uh, solution, which is open source. Uh, and you can run this once you prototype it, maybe locally or uh, even on their for free tier, then you can go for larger applications. So th these are all scalable, I would say, but and storage is not cheap these days, right? So storage is not necessarily a problem. But as, as usual, concurrency and uh, you know scalability is a problem. If you want a lot of users doing that, now the limit is 
how many users can access your server, especially if it's only one server, it's not multiple, it's not distributed. Scalability could be an issue. Thanks. Do you have any tips on how to handle errors? I mean, like, for example, when uh, the example that you showed earlier that you input like five genes, what if I am, what if the fifth gene is written wrong or whatever? Oh, is right. Actually, not working or is it just yeah. skipping that error? Well, it also depends on your uh, coding uh, habits, all right? You should check that. And actually, I have code there to check the list of the genes. Where was this? Uh, just type our name. That one? Just type a name. A name from one of us. Yeah, but, uh, well, yeah, if you type something that's just, uh, but I think first it, it I have, uh, yeah, in the JavaScript. Let's see if it crashes. <laughs> no, it doesn't crash. It's, it could not recognize the genes. Well, so it refuses to, to yeah, it's going to check the list of genes they provide. But again, this is part of the code there. And actually, for this, there is a database query that happens before to check the gene list. I thought I had another place that, oh, yeah, there is. Do you a, know about Rlang? Match, um, match R. Yeah. Do you uh, do you know about the match dot R function in base R? Yeah. You don't you don't know about it? Yeah, I think it's what for regular expressions or for what? No. Uh, so go to just search R lang. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, I mean, there's a base R function for it too. Does it match? Just, just, just type up our link. Okay. Then go to the second link. Go to uh, reference. Um, At the top left. Then uh, search match. Yeah. So arg match. Arg match. Oh yeah. Okay. Click an arg match. Let's scroll to the years. To the examples further below. Scroll down, scroll down. Oh. Oh. Yeah, so that, that first example, right? So there you're defining a function that has an argument x, those two accepted values are foo and bar. Um, and so inside of it, you have an arg match. And so, like, there someone is typing, like, oh, uh, the function with bar and it works all correctly. But let's say um, they try it with uh, which is B there. Um, and so it tells the user like, hey, uh, X must be one of foo or bar, not B. Or let's say you type bass, right? With a C. Oh, so it basically out of like, hey, like, uh, it has to be foo or bar, but then it also provides a, a, a hint that you mean the bar. <laughs> right. right, it kind of. And so you use this with your list of all the gene symbols because your error doesn't say like, just as like, oh, oh, this is right. not a valid symbol, but it doesn't tell people like what are potential. Right, this is me. This is the uh, kind of a similarity search for that in the database because the way I check the genes, I really check the database of genes mm -hmm. table. Mm -hmm. I have these gene symbols. Mm -hmm. So I guess that question could be uh, query, could be made like, uh, more like similarity instead of the exact matches. Right now, I was looking for exact matches. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. Yeah, that's an extra. <laughs> that was actually my second question. Like, this, did you mean that's amazing? What's that? Uh, this, like, did you mean the so basically the suggestion of the real yeah, solution? Did you basically? mean part of that? Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, that was that's cool. I guess it, it found a similar. Well, in this case, it's very easy. You have a small list of possibilities, just two in this example. But basically, yeah, I, I, you could also say, like, do a similarity search with what's the closest gene name that looks like the gene name you just mistyped, yeah. right? Of course, this, this is done in many places, and yeah, it just needs extra code that could be written by compilers. <laughs> yes, I don't know, with the hand, but to be Probably easy to add if you just have the time and remember to do it. <laughs> yeah, but you haven't you haven't implemented any unit tests for your R code. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> First of all, this is very kind of little R compared to I mean it was maybe a large 
code. Uh, I would imagine like instead of sourcing our functions, you put your functions in the NAR package. At that point, you can unit test the functions in the NAR package. Right, that's what I and said. Then, yeah. And then, then instead of uh, sourcing the script that you had in line five of your table, at that point, you just load in the, uh, an internal package you made. Because right? it right. only needs to be installed in, in, the, in the server. Right, right. That's uh, that's actually I have this use case, but it's not a proper test uh, unit testing. Uh, it's really just basically I can source that code uh, and uh, override the database connection. So I use it to test these functions just by connecting to the server. But even in this case, I have some functions that behave differently. That was a very annoying. Uh, they behave differently when they run in the server than when they run into the into my, you know, off, uh, not offline, but basically from the client. And there was some subtle differences there. I think uh, I didn't follow uh, the R Postgres SQL DBI uh, specifications properly. That was related to the way you retrieve results from the database server. It was differently when I, I got a different data structure when I select remotely from the client to test my code before I uploaded. When I uploaded it, uh, some particular query was returning in a slightly different format. Same data, but in a different format, packaging the data frame. I, I forgot what was, uh, but that was, actually I had this in code. I even commented that when you run this locally, you have to comment. That was the way, if the database connection handler is null, that's why I had, I can go that branch and still test my overall code and plotting and everything. But yeah, there was no special specific unit testing, which I, I never got to do actually <laughs> properly, but yeah, it should be. Well, have a good weekend, everyone.